Okay. Um, I think most people who were, were here were at last night's talk, uh, talk on me, weren't they? Most people? What I, I looked at the topic and I looked at what I gave you last night and I realised if I covered formally what the topic says, I'll be repeating a lot of what I said yesterday. So what I thought I might instead do is talk a bit about how I got to the position I have on the role of credit in a capitalist economy and, uh, and some of the um, intellectual debates that went along as, as part of forming that. And because the first thing I did to get me into working in post-Keynesian economics rather than history of economic thought, which is where I began with my master's thesis, was attempting to model Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And like a lot of people, I read John Maynard Keynes, his book. His book. Has anybody here read who? Minsky's book, John Maynard Keynes? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't read it. Yeah. Who's read Stabilising an Unstable Economy? Okay. Who read it? Huh? Who read it? Who has read Has anybody here read that one? I read it. Okay. okay, that's his bad one, in my I opinion. Know. That's a book I wouldn't bother reading, of Minsky's. But John Maynard Keynes was in the best possible statement at book length. Um, and I, to me, it was an incredibly compelling vision. And in doing my master's, I read that in 1987. I thought, right, when I do my PhD, that's what I'll base my PhD on. But I did work on Marx in the meantime, my master's itself. But a lot of people, when they read Minsky, they see the whole idea of hedge, uh, speculative and Ponzi finance, and they think at this sort of level of agents and transitioning and so on. This is the point that actually struck me, this particular point here, the natural starting point for analysing the relation between debt and income is to take an economy that is a cyclical path that is doing well. Now, with the, with the background I had in differential equations, that to me was saying, that's your initial conditions in a dynamic system, and you need a dynamic system which explains the role of debt in the economy. And I think that's why I had such a degree of conflict initially uh, in trying to put my ideas forward, because a lot of what occurs in, at the same time with, with Win Godley's work was building stock flow consistent models. And an essential element of that, of course, was expenditure is income. Okay. There must be identity between the two. Now, when I first started phrasing what I was talking about, I was talking about aggregate demand being a sum of income plus change in debt, which I knew, of course, there's an identity, but I'm saying at the same time, the creation of debt creates new spending power. And I was trying to put that across in a way that would both work intellectually and would communicate with post-Keynesians. Um, I found I could do the former more easily than the latter, because the, just like the neoclassicals rule out the role of credit entirely by imagining credit is a transaction between you know, individuals and the privacy of their own um, office as opposed to bedroom, and therefore has no impact on what anybody else does. The post-Keynesian attitude was because expenditure is income, to some extent, some people in that community would argue there's no role for credit. Okay? And I was saying, well, there is a role for credit. And Michael Hudson and I are on a similar line. I think Louis-Philippe, you're willing to object with you. I think you're in a similar position as well. There's, there's got to be a role for credit somehow. We've got to explain its role. And yet at the same time, a lot of people who have been in the formal wing godly style modelling were saying there can't be a role because expenditure is income, therefore income is expenditure, and therefore you can't get a resolution. And I remember with um, one of the first times I realised I was more than just uh, one individual putting this position saying there must be a role for credit was with Michael Hudson in New York. And uh, Michael and I had corresponded what year with... Was this? What year was this? With Michael, it would have been 2002 or three. Okay. Maybe, maybe 2006. It's hard to remember. I'm getting old. He's in Kansas City. Pardon? He's in Kansas City. No, Michael was never really in Kansas City. He was teaching out of Kansas City. He's always lived in New York. Oh. Yeah. And he actually asked me at one point, we met up in my hotel, and he was saying to me, what is aggregate demand? And I said, it's income plus change in debt. And his reaction was, why can't other people see that? But at the same time, other people would see that and see a mathematical error. Okay? Because expenditure is income, so how can it be income plus change in debt? And that's the overall perspective I want to explain how I got there, because it certainly wasn't a linear process of getting there. But what I started from was building a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, which I presume most people here would be moderately familiar with. This is my paper in the uh, Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. 
Okay. And now what I was doing in doing that modeling is working more as an applied, I'm, I'm not, I would not call myself a mathematician because I know what it takes to get a PhD in mathematics. I could have done one if I'd continued on at university, but I, I didn't from first year because I couldn't stand my applied maths lecturer. And now I work largely as an applied mathematician in economics, so I suppose that's his revenge on me. Um, but I love the use of differential equations describing dynamic systems. And I also was exposed by sheer accident uh, to a brilliant book by a guy called John Blatt. Has anybody heard of the name Blatt, B-L-A-T-T? Okay, I'll bring it up. Um, let's see, just give me a tick to find the actual publication. And um, this is going to be more of a raconteur than a, than a lecture. Uh, but Blatt was a remarkable uh, individual who was an Austrian, I think he came out with his parents, that he's an Austrian refugee to Australia uh, because of Hitler. And he's, I've never met him. In some ways, I'm probably glad that I didn't meet him because I hear he's incredibly rude. And he would just, he'd whinge about his PhD and think, these students just don't know, I can't, I'm doing a bad Austrian accent, but you know, these students just don't know how to do their math, they're such stupid people. Uh, he was involved in building the world's second computer, which is called the Ciliac, which was a computer built in the basement of the physics building at Sydney University. And to give you an idea of what that uh, building was like, I did see it once because one of my best friends, his father was the professor of computer science, and at this stage Black was one of his PhD students, I think, of postdocs. They built this computer. The memory for this computer was an array, I think, of 24 by 80 cathode ray tubes, each tube divided into, each, each CRT divided into about 20 or so squares, which were either illuminated or off. And what, when you actually to read data, the cathode ray tube would scan over and it would do destructive read-write. So if it got enough feedback to realise there was actually the phosphorus was, was, was emitting photons, it would take that to, that to one, and then it would rewrite the one as it went past unless the operation changed it. And if there was a, a blank, then it was a zero, and it left it as a zero. Destructive read right Now, in that, Christopher Bennett's father, who was a professor of computer science, built an algorithm that I think could invert an 80 by 80 matrix. This is before we built Gaussian row normal echelon, row, row echelon operations, which are much more efficient. Um, so remarkable pro programming, and this is Black's initial background. He then wrote the textbook on, applied math on, on quantum mechanics in the 50s, and was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize for Physics, but he didn't get it. Uh, ended up being the Professor of Applied Mathematics at New South Wales University, which is where I did my PhD, and where I mainly learned by attending lectures in mathematics by the mathematics staff, who were all both selected by and intimidated by one John Blatt. Um, John Blatt, as I said, famously rude. Okay. And I, I think I'm... I'm in many ways, I'm continuing the work he would have done had he continued living into these 120s. Um, so I maybe would get on if he met me after he did my work, but I don't think he would have liked me if he always has. It would have been one of those stupid PhD students who couldn't understand anything. Anyway, um, also at New South Wales University was a man called Murray Kemp. Murray Kemp's still alive. Murray is a leading neoclassical uh, international trade theorist. Uh, but by sense, he's a wonderful human being. Murray personally has only one flaw. He's always beaten me playing tennis. Okay. That's the one thing I'll hold against him. But a wonderful man. But straight neoclassical. Just sees everything in neoclassical terms. And he was also <laughs> nominated for the Nobel Prize in Economics and didn't get it. There, and therefore he regarded John Blatt as his only true peer at New South Wales University. He made the mistake of inviting John to come along and give a seminar. Or this, listen to Murray give a seminar in Economics. So Murray, this is all, I, I wasn't actually there, I've heard the whole story but from my, my fellow staff and fellow students at the time. So Black turns up and he's sitting in the room and Murray's giving a lecture on Heckscher Oil and International Trade Theory modified for some, you know, the usual sort of stuff neoclassicals do for giving a model. And he finishes and just asks John what he thinks. And as, again, as best I can do a fake Austrian accent, he said, what do you think of the paper? And he says, that is the greatest load of rubbish I've sat through in decades. And if that is supposed to be advanced economics, there's something seriously wrong with economics. I intend finding out what it is. Good day. Several years later, he published this book, which I still regard as one of the great books in the history of economic thought, neglected because most people 
don't know that he did the work, but it's an applied mathematician's take on economics going right back to the physiocrats. And to just give you an idea of his position, his, his opinion of the greatest economist of all time is Francois Canet, who justifies it in the book. So to make that accessible for those who'd like to see what I regard as uh, truly a fabulous foundation that most people don't even know exists for economics, if you go to my debtdeflation.com website, I've scanned and put the book there. It's out of print, but you click on that link, you can download it. Okay? The family knows I'm doing this, and I hope to get it republished at some stage. The reason for that long uh, dis discretion, uh, you know, diversion, the whole, the whole talk's going to be a diversion, so get used to it, um, was that he gave the best explanation of Goodwin's growth cycle model. So I'll just go to that page. be roughly 204, let's see. Ah, no, no, okay, 100. 100, because, oh, hang on, page 100 would be roughly 204, yeah, okay, because I've read Goodwin, and Richard Goodwin, from what I can tell of both personal correspondence with him, and what people tell me about him, is a wonderful human being, very much the bon homie, an artist, as well as a mathematician, very humble, he actually made work, no, Richard Goodwin spent his final years working in the university in Siena, and I was aware of that. I found out later he didn't actually apply for a position there or be offered an emeritus type position. He went through the standard examination process. Despite his impact, he had such a low ego that he's willing just to apply competitively and he got in competitively to work at Siena. So I believe he might be a bit more detailed than I know on that one, but that's what's what I've been told. Anyway, he, he's a brilliant mathematician, math mathematical economist, but he couldn't write to save his life in my opinion. I read the, the, the uh, trade cycle model paper. I knew there was something I should use inside there, but it wasn't accessible. Black gives a brilliant explanation, and that's what I'm looking at here. I'll just see if I can make that larger. Let's see. Yeah. So he gives a, a very straightforward explanation for how the model was derived. And then at the end of it, he said, this would be, he said, this is a good model that only has one flaw. The equilibrium is not unstable. Okay? Rather than a neoclassical economist saying, there's something wrong with the model, its equilibrium isn't a stable equilibrium. Well, let's rule out, um, you know, Ponzi finance to avoid, let's make the trans, no, transversality assumption, which they make in DSU models to get rid of non equilibrium outcomes. That's because it didn't have an unstable equilibrium. He said, maybe you can make it unstable by adding finance. So my thought was, this is, now I understand Goodwin's model, this is the vehicle to bring Minsky in. And what, Minsk, what Goodwin had in the model was capitalists invest all their profits. Now, of course, that means they also destroy capital whenever they make losses. It's a linear assumption, perfectly linear. And I thought, well, the realistic thing is they don't invest all their profits, they invest more during a boom than their profits, and less during a slump. And then, of course, to do that, they've got to borrow money. So they borrow money, and their, their, their investment is therefore, the change in debt is equal to investment minus profits. And then I built that model on that basis, and then I got the results that uh, turned up in my paper uh, on the way I was going. But of course, debt played an essential role in that model. But I was trying to communicate it to post Kansians who I think have got two major flaws in how they have been educated. One, they've learnt mathematics from a neoclassical economists. That's a waste of fucking time. Pardon me. Okay. Learn it from mathematicians. So the, the mathematics that they tended to use was discrete time, and a lot of the justifications for discrete time were the justifications no mathematician would tolerate. Because, for example, um, you'll have post Keynesians saying, well, the data's discrete, therefore we should use discrete time. In other words, we get debt data every month and GDP every quarter, and therefore, since the data is coming in discrete, we should use discrete time for it. Nobody ever argues that we get population numbers every five years, therefore <coughs> we can model population growth as a discrete time event where babies take five years to be born. Okay. What you have is a smooth distribution, asynchronous, of people being born, therefore the best way to model that is continuous time. And exactly the same thing applies for economics. And of course there's a whole range of mathematical issues about discrete time modelling versus continuous time modelling that you have to do a mathematics degree to realise the problems. And I was lucky enough to do that you know, at that, that university. So I found myself struggling trying to come from a mathematical point of view uh, towards a school of thought 
that was logical and grounded well in a, in a realistic institutional view of capitalism, but didn't understand the mathematical approach I was taking. So a lot of conflict came out of that. Now, a major part of it was trying to explain the role of, of debt, but because I saw there was a role, seeing this in the data, this exponential rise in the level of private debt to GDP is what got me into warning about the potential for a financial crisis. So when I started making my warnings about a, uh, let's make that a bit larger as well. Uh, hang on. When I started making the warnings I did about the level of, of private debt, it was at the end, of, just at the end of 2006. So it was about that line there. And what I'd done is I was working, as it happens, for a, as an expert witness in a legal case about predatory lending. I wrote a throwaway line about debt rising faster than GDP exponentially. I knew I couldn't rely upon hyperbole because I was, when you're an expert in the Australian legal system, you're employed by the court. You can't make any non-verifiable statement. So I went and downloaded the data. I thought it would be rising at exponential. That's uh, looking at the American data. Uh, what I first looked at was the Australian data. I'll just actually quickly change that. Hang on a second. It won't quite. Okay, now let's go back and take a look at that chart now. Okay, that was so close to an exponential relationship with the section of data that I had, which was this point here. The only reason it wasn't a pure exponential was this hyper bubble in the 80s and also an earlier in the 70s. So I realized two things. I was correct to use of exponential. I could legitimately justify saying the ratio was rising exponentially with respect to time, and there was gonna be a crisis I had to warn about it. So that there was a sense of panic to how I was writing from 2006 on because I saw it as being something which um, I had to make a warning that I couldn't wait for the journals to publish. So I put all my stuff into blogs and newspapers and interviews and so on. But I then found myself having to make the intellectual case for the role of debt after the crisis actually occurred. And at the same time, the post-Keynesian profession was caught on a dispute between what's called structuralist and horizontalist views of the role of the banking sector. And this again comes back to how we intellectually tend to think in economics, we draw diagrams. And in that sense, we're still following a legacy from Marshall, who I've made the case that he, he, he works at the mathematics, does a diagram, if the diagram works, he throws the mathematics away, and we're stuck in a, a diagram. You can't, you can't show genuine complex systems dynamics in two dimensions on a sheet of paper. You simply can't. So we're using an intellectual framework that stopped us seeing what we were trying to describe. And this horizontalist versus structuralist thing was saying, what's the demand, what's the supply curve of money? Okay, well, you draw it on a shine of sheet of paper, it's a horizontal line, or it rises somehow. And then you're caught in the structuralist versus horizontalist thing. And at the same time, if you look at the work being done by a lot of post-Keynesians. This is a, a very good paper by Giuseppe Fontana. Uh, it, if they were using discrete time, then in a time period, nothing changes. Between the periods, everything changes. And so the processes you were trying to capture were occurring between the time periods you're analysing. And they basically fell through the cracks. So I found that just period time thinking combined with putting stuff in diagrams rather than dynamic systems all led to this inability to see a role for credit in the way the economy functions. So I found myself arranging and arranging and involved a range of conversations which I won't mention names, but I have had leading post Keynesians tell me that people pay for housing out of their savings. I thought, hang on, where's the role for mortgage debt in that? Where's credit? How do you bring it in? So that's that led to the next stage where Louis Philippe plays a major role because in the review of Keynesian economics, he was bringing in the people who were putting a critique of me on one side, my position on the other. And have you ever met Feiberger? Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, his critique was probably the most helpful. Very thorough, very... Uh, yeah, very thorough, very precise. And what he basically said, I'll see if I can find uh, his quote here. Is he talking about the paper that published his critique of your paper? Pardon? In his critique of your paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what he, first of all, what he did was a, a, attack um, me on the argument that there was a difference between expenditure and income. He said, oh, if I can actually find that statement, hang on a sec. And this is the, the reason I'm partly going through this approach is I'm aware that as, as a young PhD student or you know, a master's student or a young postdoc, um, you've done some research yourself and essays and things like that. When you see a presentation with somebody like me, you're often seeing something which looks very polished. You know, even if it's got errors, you see the final product. You don't see the mess that gets you there. So a large part of what you've got to learn, I think, is like you were talking in your own presentation. It takes a long time to build up the overall understanding. And you look back and you see how the shit that I write that, you know. But it, it's what got me towards where I am now. So one major point that Feiberger made here is that I was effectively, from his point of view, um, saying that expenditure was greater than expenditure, income was greater than expenditure, income was less than expenditure, etc., etc. That's what he's saying in this table here. Hang on. Ah, I'm trying to move that side, but there we go. Um, so he's saying if you look at what Minsky was saying, again, Minsky was attempting to build the same sort of logic as I'm doing, in my opinion, but he was using it during discrete time. So there's a section in Minsky's papers where um, he uses difference equation logic to try to explain the role of credit. And Feinberger looked at this and said, look, it's just a set of tautologies. Don't make any sense and put your time inside there. And then when you put time inside, all you get is that expenditure this year exceeds expenditure last year. It's just a tautology. Um, but the point which triggered, I think, the work that let me bring my whole argument on the role of credit in aggregate demand and income together was this one. Now, Les King can explain how a purchase of a good or service does not provide income for the seller. He should rethink his claim of debt extensions and force and inequality between expenditure and income at the aggregate level. Now, what I was trying to do was actually say that when people borrow money, they borrow to spend, and that gives you a discontinuous jump in a continuous time system. I was using arguments from integration, the Berg integration and things like that, trying to explain it, got nowhere. And I thought, well, he's right. I have to be able to put this in a sense where expenditure is identical to income all the way through. And out of that, I developed what I've called expenditure income tables. And um, I'll find the simpler version of it here, but this, that's what got published in, in the review of Keynesian economics, a set of tables showing that the argument that credit played a role was completely logically consistent. But I'll bring up the simplified version that I've done here. And this is to say, I, I built an expenditure income matrix, and I, I still want to program this into Minsky, I haven't had a chance to do that yet. But rather than showing the, the typical tabular view that's part of the, the uh, stock flow consistent modeling, where you have an entry <coughs> on one Co co column and entry in another column and then necessarily sum to zero across the rows. These do the same thing, but I put the expenditure on the diagonal of a matrix. So I've got three sectors, sectors yeah, one, two, three effectively here, and A is the expenditure of sector one on sector two, B is the expenditure on sector two, sector one on sector three, and C is the expenditure of sector two on sector one, and D is the expenditure of sector two on sector three, and so on. So all the rows necessarily sum to zero. The negative of the diagonal is, is aggregate expenditure, the negative of the sum, and the sum of the off-diagonal elements is aggregate income, and they're necessarily equal to each other. So this is now addressing Feiberger's comment. And what I have then also argued, I want to bring this into um, the quantity theory of money position that Friedman buggerized, but portrayed himself as a monetarist, that demand comes from the circulation of money. Uh, I saw a flaw in that as well, where you should also bring in the role of credit into that equation to make it actually genuine for a, a true capitalist economy. So what I have here is, I call it SL for sales law, effectively because expenditure is income. There's no debt in that particular model. And when you say that 
A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F are the turnover of existing money, then you can substitute that with the velocity of money times the stock of money, and you get your the outcome that aggregate demand and aggregate income is the circulation of money. That's it. Now, the second level here, I have sector two, uh, sector one, sector one borrowing from sector two. So there's now, as well as transactions going horizontally for expenditure, one sector and another, you also have income transfers or cash transfers. So sector two is lending L dollars per year to sector one, and sector one is then spending that on sector three, and sector one, of, sector two has less to spend on sector three itself. So I've still got exactly the same idea, all the, all the rows sum to zero. This is now loanable funds. This is the neoclassical model of loanable funds. And when you simplify it out, interestingly enough, again, I got a surprise out of this. Rather than saying that aggregate demand is the turnover of existing money, it can be turnover of existing money plus interest on debt. But both expenditure and income are equally affected. So even in the neoclassical framework, even though credit doesn't turn up, interest on the level of outstanding debt does turn up because if you have a flow of debt in dollars per year, or flow of credit in dollars per year, you must have an outstanding stock of debt. And the reason you've got the debt is because one sector is lending to you to get the income flow from the interest, so you're paying interest to sector two, which is why sector two is paying that money. So that's loanable funds. Now endogenous money is where you borrow from a bank. So a bank is creating a new liability for itself, which is cash for you to spend. So its actual creation of money is off this matrix. I want to generalise the matrix, so I make it assets and liabilities and equity as well. I haven't done that yet. I intend doing that in Minsky. But now what I've got, you're borrowing a flow of L dollars per year from a bank. Okay. And you're spending that flow of L dollars per year on another sector, and you're paying interest to the bank. So the bank now turns up and it has its own spending as well. And when I substitute this uh, flow of new debt is the change in debt. Have you read the Katsiani or? Who? who? Katsiani. Oh, of course. So, because this is all in, you know. Yeah, it's all, it's the circuit that's got it right. That's got it's the monetary circuit. Pardon? It's, it's the monetary circuit. Yeah, exactly. Oh. exactly. They were right. The circuits were right. They, put, they used the wrong mathematics. Graziani's paper, um, what's it called again? The Graziani's uh, paper, the... Which one? The 79 one from the Thames Economic Papers. Um, I can't I remember. I have it here. I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. But that, that was another great paper that gave me a vision for the role of banking. I'll talk about that in a moment. But this is now coming out and the conclusion of this is that aggregate demand is a turn of existing money plus financial transactions, plus credit. Okay. So it, was a, it's taken about, it took about 10 years to get from the initial insight, which I was comfortable with, the whole that aggregate demand is income plus change in debt, to finally saying it's not income plus change in debt, it's turnover of existing money plus change in debt. But did they not change the plan? No, uh, the monetary theory of production. The monetary theory of production, I think it is. I'll just see if I can find it. Hang on. It'll be in my bibliography. I think I reproduced it in my, uh, in my book. Uh, a monetary theory of production. Yeah. That's it, monetary theory of production. So, and thanks for mentioning that because I've, I hadn't included it here. But that was what led to the building of the Minsky software because Again, if you think about the mindset we have from neoclassicals, commerce is a two-person, two-commodity vision. This is the, the Barter view of money, the, you know, the money illusion perspective, is that all trades have got two people with two commodities. And what you've got to work out is a relative price. So one person is selling apples, the other person is selling oranges. You have an exchange which might be simplified by money, but it's fundamentally a barter exchange, two people, two commodities. Graziani said, no, a monetary economy is a triangular relationship where you have a buyer with money, a seller with a commodity, and a bank that records a transfer of money from the buyer's account to the seller's account, and the good is transferred in, in fulfilment of the monetary transfer. So you have a, a vision of a triangular 
three agents, one commodity and money is the vision. And that's what led to the development of Minsky. So I'll go back now a bit and show you that I didn't even think about whether my model of, Min of Minsky was stock flow consistent. Because working in differential equations, if you defined your flows right, it's stock flow consistent. Okay. It is um, a set of differential equations. Uh, if you make a mistake in something like the stock flow consistency of that model, so if you have two equations or two system states depending upon the same flow, and you give the wrong sign to one of them, it'll explode. It'll reach a singularity and, and crash. So I didn't even think about it, but uh, once I built Minsky, I could build a version of my model of Minsky in Minsky, which is what this one is here. So I showed you in the talk yesterday the straight differential equation system, and I didn't have a banking system inside there. But now, uh, what I have in this model, the reason it is stock flow consistent, is that I basically assume that workers consume their wages and bankers consume their profits. So this has firms borrowing money. This is this, I'll show the accounts that there's reserves, which are static in this model. Debt, which is a debt of the, the, finance, of the, of the uh, corporate sector to the banking sector. Deposits for the firm sector. Deposits for the household sector and the bank's equity. And I have the, when there's borrowing money going on, uh, the bank is lending money to the firm sector and then pay, the firm sector pays wages to the workers and the workers consume all the wages. The firm sector pays interest to the banks and the bank consumes all its interest. So fundamentally I'm leaving out any time lags in that process. I'm leaving out any borrowing by households and so on. But that model, which includes a banking sector now, has exactly the same characteristics as I showed you with the model I ran yesterday. And it can lead to the sort of financial crisis that I modelled in Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So um, that, I think, of, I'm going to conclude in a fairly strange point, I think, but that's, that's the long-term process that's led me to a, a capacity to combine the nonlinear differential equation modelling approach that I took with the stock flow consistent approach. But it's only the very beginning. And uh, I'll finish up by talking a bit about Minsky and the take questions in general. But what Minsky was designed to do is to enable you to model a financial sector in great detail and to rapidly redesign a model of the financial sector if you want to change the, the definition, the characteristics. Because if you want to do it with this, the differential equation stuff I'm showing right now, if you have defined um, your financial system using the standard software that exists for dynamic modelling, programs like Vensim, VizSim, Stellar, I think. Has anybody heard of those programs? I have those. Okay, some of you have. Um, all those programs, if you want to build a model of a financial system, you've got to do it using flowcharts to build mathematical equations. So this equation, for example, uh, capital stock divided by uh, velocity is equal to output. That That's... That set of blocks there is defining an equation. Or have I got that over here? Okay. It's defining that equation as a flow chart. And that's easy enough if you're working with flows. But if you're working with a model of a financial system, see, I thought I had that one loaded, I better go back and find it again now. Uh, okay. Let's say you want to model the neoclassical vision of what lending is, because the reason. Ah, oh great, why isn't that loaded and put it properly? Hang on. There's an error. Great. I've created an error with that file by loading it in a later version of the software. Give me a moment, I'll bring up the, the beta of Minsky and I'll talk a bit about that too if anybody wants to ask me about it. So this is... Why is that not loading? I'm doing a great demo here. Russell would hate me. Uh, okay, that's the version I'm after. Right. <laughs> so what I've done here is I've taken Krugman's and Eggertson's model of banking and 
what they've done in their so-called model of banking is they pretend that a bank is the life of a single loan contract and it's a loan between one agent and another agent. Of course, the agent who lends has less money, the agent who borrows has more money, so one cancels the other out. And I thought, well, I want to show why endogenous money matters. And the best way to do that to a neoclassical is to take their model and show what happens when you change its structure. Now, what Minsky lets me do is, rather than having to build a flowchart model like this one here, I can build it using double entry bookkeeping. So this is a model of loanable funds done using double entry bookkeeping in Minsky. And what I have here as lending is between a consumer agent and an investment agent. And of course, if the consumer sector lends, it has less money in its bank account. The investment sector gets more money. The repayment goes the opposite direction. Interest payments go from the, investment, from the investment agent to the consumer agent. And the bank makes money by charging a fee. That's the, new, that's the loanable funds model. And what I showed was, if that was a structurally correct definition of a banking sector, then the neoclassicals would be right that you can ignore the banking sector because I've got a growth rate of zero. If you just take a look at where that scale is at the moment, that's zero there. GDP is flatlining at 200 thingamajigs per year. And the debt ratio is stabilising down here. Ratio of debt to GDP is stabilising to about 0.4. And what I can do with Minsky is I can change the rate at which lending occurs and rate at which repayment occurs dynamically while the program is running. So if I now just start increasing how fast lending occurs, you'll notice tiny changes occurring in the growth rate. If I slow down repayment as well, you get obviously an increasing debt ratio down here. You can see the debt ratio rising. But nothing is particularly happening to GDP. And in fact, the growth rate dropped when the lending began. So it's a reason to ignore the financial sector. Now, I'll go back and reset that to the levels I had initially. Ah, pardon me. There's a few bugs in the software, so sometimes when I press a key, it jumps windows rather than uh, moving where I want it to. So I'll start, I'll move this using the sliders. Let's see. Okay. So you can see, I had a, in this particular model, I've had a huge change in the level of debt, huge debt bubble, and it doesn't matter. You can ignore it. Okay. Now, if I wanted to rewire this to make it endogenous money, and I was working in the flowchart paradigm that most of these programs have, it'd be a, I'd have to change about 20 wires. I'd be mucking around for ages, and I'd almost certainly make a mistake because I might change the sign on one system state and not change on the other. But if you're using, working with double entry bookkeeping, I can go inside the consumer sector's view here and say, well, it's a myth to say that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. It's actually an asset of the banking sector. So I can just simply delete it from that table. So now I've just got the consumer sector only having a deposit account and net equity because it doesn't have any debt. And all these lending operations here are a fallacy. So I'll get rid of those. And I go across to the banking sector and say, well, notice that now my rows don't sum to zero anymore. Okay. So Minsky's kept track of the accounting for me. And I'm going to say, well, in fact, the loan is an asset at the banking sector. Now, I've deleted the loan as an asset at the consumer sector, but the loan is still sitting in the model as a liability of the investment sector. So if I click on this little arrow here, it shows that debt is one liability which is not yet shown as an asset for anybody else. So I can bring it across here, and Minsky now corrects everything which can correct by saying, well, there's actually the loan uh, is paid, taken out by the investment sector and repayment is done by the investment sector. All I have to do is fix up the leftover operations. So I can delete the bank fee, which is a fiction. I know banks charge fees, but it's not the main thing they do. Interest payments are made to the bank reset the system and start rolling again, I get a positive rate of growth, a growing level of money supply, and if I change the rate of lending so it speeds up, we get a boom. If repayment goes the same way, an even bigger boom. And then if there's a slump uh, because lending slows down, you have a financial crisis. Now, that sort of illustration is a major reason why 
I designed Minsky. But what I want to do as well is make it a vehicle for building large-scale models of economies, effectively being the replacement for the DSG models that neoclassicals do, but have them being used by central banks rather than you know, the crappy models they're currently doing. And um, as part of that, um, one thing I know which is a problem still with Minsky is these things, because what I'm doing here is defining a whole range of variables. And for a small model like this, it's okay, I can take you through the explanations, but it would be better if I could define them on a separate tab like this one over here. This equation tab is just taking what I've defined on the canvas and putting it in equation format. But it'd be really cool to be able to define something like a definition for a GDP is, you know, C plus I plus G plus X minus M and have that separately somewhere else and then you just put GDP wherever it's needed on the canvas. You'd reduce clutter. Because I hadn't done that yet, I knew, I knew that you could not use Minsky to model a national economy. Okay? Absolutely knew that. So, somebody who didn't know that modelled Minsky. Uh, and let's see if I can find his paper here. Hang on a second. Uh, so, out of the blue, hang on, I better go to the Minsky software instead. A Portuguese guy who was doing his master's degree sent me his model for comment. And my comment was, holy shit, how the fuck did you do that? Because I hope it works. This is crashing at the... Let's see, here we go. Okay. That's a model of the Portuguese economy. It's more accurate than the model the central bank uses because of the central bank model doesn't include money, whereas this model does. You can't see it because to actually define all those definitions, which is what 99% of what you see there, they're just definitions. It's the only way you can do it right now. As I knew, nobody in their right mind could possibly use Minsky to do exactly what Pedro has done. Because he would have been doing this on a bloody laptop. I mean, this is a 4,000 by 2,000 pixel screen I'm working on here. Um, if you actually did this on a tiny, normal, normal price laptop, it'd be 30 or 40 screens. Heaven knows how he did it, but he did it. And he's now doing his PhD with me. Brilliant, brilliant work. I'll just zoom in and show you. But this, that's even, even, even zoomed up factor of four, you can't read the text there. So I'll go back to normal scale. So what's actually being defined there is the government deficit. Okay. Now, in fact, you could whack all that on a separate tab and then just use that a definition where it's needed. And then all you'd be left with in this model, pardon me, I've added an extra operator by accident there, uh, all you'd be left with would be these tables. And what those tables show is all the logic of the program. Pardon me. Government transfers, VAT, gross operating surplus, income tax, deficit with the rest of the world, etc., etc. And Minsky is then automatically generating the matching tables for households, productive sector, rest of the world, financial sector. So all the logic is included in the tables. And then, of course, the idea is that's the sort of thing you can actually explain to a politician. Because, again, a huge part of what we have to do at some point is communicate with policymakers, even people as stupid as Donald Trump, there's my obligatory mention of him, um, and say, if you can read this table, you can understand the model. Now, at the moment, what they get is a whole set of tables of numbers coming out of DSG numbers and a few wonky graphs with everything returning to equilibrium. So what I want to give them is say, here's a model. This is the logic. Look through the tables. You understand it? Right. OK. Now try to do fiscal policy or monetary policy. See what happens. Run that surplus. See what happens. And have not just one computer input, but have 10 or 20. So you have 20 inputs. They can all be managing different variables. You can then test and see what happens. I want them to be able to simulate the economy and see the impact on it before they want to do it to the real world. So that's the overall ambition for Minsky. I'll shut up there and take questions. What do you think? We'll do one. We'll do one. Anyone need a coffee after that?
said coffee break and then questioned that. Okay. Okay, then we think I'll come back after that. That's good.